Father, we, we thank you for your gifts and your, your generosity to us. God, you've been so gracious and so kind to uh, me as an individual, to us as individuals, but to us as a church as well. God, and I know in my own heart and I know in the hearts of so many, we can very quickly start to, to take credit for the gifts that we have. Start to convince ourselves that we earned these things, we worked for them, we, we sought them out, and we achieved these things on our own, but, but we know from your word that everything, everything that we have is a gift from you and that every good gift comes from you. God, and so I, I pray that you will, you will forgive us. Forgive us for the times where we try to take credit for your gifts. Forgive us for the, the times where we are ungrateful, where we act entitled, and where we're, we're filled with <clears throat> pride or arrogance, God. And I pray that you'll cultivate in us hearts of gratitude and humility, understanding, acknowledging just the, the ways that you've blessed us to cherish these gifts and to, to praise you for them. And Father, I, I also thank you for the ways that you've blessed Beacon and the gifts that you've given to us as a spiritual family and the ways that you've provided buildings and resources and opened up doors for our ministry to continue to be able to reach people, God. These are gifts from you. And we cherish these gifts and we praise you for them. God, and it's our, our hope and our prayer that with these gifts, we don't just use them for our own enjoyment, we don't just use them for our own pleasure, but instead that we will take these gifts and, and use them to build up your kingdom, to understand that you've been resourcing us so that we can take these resources and to fulfill the mission that you've set us out on. God, and we pray for your, your spirit's wisdom and power toward that end. I, I pray as Robert comes up to lead us in your word, God, I pray that you'll be doing a work in our hearts, opening us up to what your word has to teach us, giving us soft hearts and open minds. God, and I, I pray that your spirit will also be doing work in him and through him. That as he opens your word, God, that we aren't just hearing his thoughts, but that we're actually hearing from your very spirit speaking to our hearts, convicting us, challenging us, encouraging us, and supporting us to be the women and men that you've created us to be. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. following me. Lonely ghosts come a calling. Lonely voices talking to me. Now I'm gone, now I'm gone, now I'm gone. I don't get mad. I get even, which is part of how I grew up. Uh, that's actually one of my mother's mantras. That's my mom there uh, in a wedding picture with my dad. Um, she's uh, long gone now, but when we were growing up, uh, this is the kind of a thing that she would say. You know, something would happen and she'd say, I don't get mad, I get even. And she would have this ominous sort of uh, an expression when she was talking about it. You know, and, and that's kind of the way you do it, right? You keep your cool and you never let them see you sweat. But if you do get a chance to bury them, you make sure you clean off the shovels real well. Like, you know, just make sure that that's all covered. And when you think about it, you know, as growing up, we, I mean, to me, it sort of felt like, you know, a really kind of a tasty rule for life to chew on. I mean, who wouldn't like that sort of an attitude, right? I mean, you hurt me, I hurt you, you don't hurt me anymore. 
like that. It, it's like karmic. It's, it's so perfect. It just, it just works. In fact, now balance has been restored. And so why would we not like that sort of thing? In fact, it sounds a whole lot like an eye for an eye. So why don't we just kind of keep that whole thing going? We're in this series called Disruptions, and we're trying to look at ways that we can handle life's disruptions by studying the life of Joseph as found in the book of Genesis. But one of the fiercest realities of our harshest disruptions is that they are most often caused by people. The people who can actually hurt you, which is often the people closest to us, but it doesn't have to be. And when people cause your life to be seriously disrupted, we naturally will get hurt and angry. And sometimes we want just a little bit of payback. Maybe not a little. Because when you have your life disrupted by a thoughtless or an uncaring or even a stupid person, and you, know, you just look at that and you go, this is, it is just all so wrong and it can lead us down a road toward resentment. And we all know what those feelings are like. Resentment is this all too familiar emotional response that creeps in when someone wrongs us. We make certain that we, we, we experience these things and we start to let them spread in our hearts. Because in some ways they're, they're somewhat satisfying. If we see a little burst of anger, maybe some indignation, it might for you be just a persistent kind of annoyance. These things, they, they, they happen when we've been treated unfairly, when someone has turned on us or something like that. And it might be coupled with a desire for revenge. And it can manifest itself from a small slight and, or it can manifest from some huge issue that has happened in your life, a massive disruption. And sometimes we see it dissipate quite quickly, and other times, well, it doesn't really dissipate. It sort of lingers and seems to want to take up residence in our hearts. So maybe you've had a betrayal from a friend or an unjust firing from your company. You've got all sorts of undeserved criticism that keeps getting shoved your way. You've had overbearing parents or disrespectful kids, or you have idiotic politicians that are just driving you absolutely mad. You have uncaring medical insurance companies that don't understand what life is really like, and, and resentment starts to build. You have churches that have failed to protect, or Christians that have been unmerciless in their judgment of you. Resentment starts to grab hold of our hearts. Resentment, it manifests in all sorts of ways, some very obvious and some way more subtle. And so if you have continual bouts of what seems like unexplained anger or frustration, resentment might be behind it. Or if you think about where your mind goes when it's supposed to be at rest, does it ever really rest or does it start to go back back in line and, and start to pull apart all of these, uh, these things that happen to you and do, you, do, 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 the, do the ruminations of your mind go back to your past hurts. Because if, if you're experiencing that, it might be because of resentment. If you've got troubled relationships all around or feelings of inadequacy or, or a sense that you're invisible in this world, or maybe you just like to keep score, right? I'm, I, I keep score because, you know, I'm carrying all the weight in the house and I'm doing this and I'm doing that and you're out gallivanting, whatever, whatever that is. They're out gallivanting and you're and you're carrying when so you keep score you're like I do that and you do this and I do that and I look mine's bigger and and this is wrong and your heart's crying for justice maybe in your relationships you feel steamrolled or overpowered or simply unheard maybe you're the primary caregiver now maybe it's your spouse maybe it's a kid it's most likely an aging parent could that possibly cause resentment? No. How could that ever happen? If it were lifestyle choices, 
that led them to that place and you to this place, and it's a significant drain on you and your plans, absolutely it can breed resentment. It might also just be that person when they, when they walk into the room. Maybe they don't even have to walk into the room. Maybe they just intrude into your mind space. And whatever that, whoever that person is, whatever they did, when you start thinking about it, does your fight or flight instinct kick in? Do you feel like the hairs on the back of your neck starting to kind of go up? There might be some resentment kicking around. And not only does resentment like to kind of cozy up and take residence in our hearts, but it's, it really seeks to try to become a part of our identity. When it, when it stays, when it lingers, when it starts to wrap its tentacles around our hearts, we start to see it's harder and harder to actually identify how we are different from our resentment. In fact, you just simply become a resentful person, and now it can be about everything. And there's all sorts of wrongs that are being perpetrated against you. There's all sorts of problems that get the resentment going again. This is, this is most likely part of the explanation of our whole outrage culture right now, which is getting us so always angry. And of course, it doesn't have to be a person. Your resentment can be directed toward an organization. It could be a religion. It could be a people group. It could be an animal, probably not a dog. One of the sages of the past said that resentment is like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. Can you imagine that? Imagine you, you're like, you know, I really want to pay them back, so here I go. And you start drinking poison. You'd be like, what an idiotic thing. And so you hear that and you're like, oh, come on. Nobody would actually do that. That's what the sages like to say because, you know, they're being witty. But no, come on, nobody... You know, you're not really going to poison yourself in your efforts to hurt another person. And yet, the Mayo Clinic would say, well, modern science seems to support this idea. They actually tell us that resentment leads to unhealthy relationships, poor mental health, anxiety, stress, hostility, drink up because there's more, high blood pressure, symptoms of depression, a weakened immune system, lower heart health, lower self-esteem, from resentment. We really are drinking the poison. And this speaks not at all about the real damage being done to our souls. How much of the poison do you really want to drink? So we're looking at some practical tools for what it means to dwell in the midst of the disruptions. And so we're going to turn back to the story of Joseph in Genesis 41, 46. Just hold that spot uh, as you open up there. But before I, I, we jump into that text, I kind of want to do a review from last week because all the next these three messages are all tied together in the life of Joseph. And so they all kind of build on each other. And so I got to kind of go back a little bit and, and frame it out for us just a touch. So Joseph's story begins as one of 12 sons. His dad was Israel. And Israel is the name of both the nation of Israel, but it started as the name of this guy, Israel, who actually became the father of this whole nation through his 12 sons. And his favored son was Joseph of Technicolor Dreamcoat fame. And that Joseph was beloved of his dad. Now, what did that do for Joseph? Well, it was great until, of course, his brothers started envying and despising Joseph because he was the favored son. So his brothers start plotting against him. And as a teenager, his brothers decided that it was, they'd had enough of Joseph. And so they plotted to kill him. So they grabbed him and they lied about what had happened to him. They threw him in a pit and they were going to have him, you know, they were going to kill him. But then they were talking about it and they're like, you know what, let's not kill him. Let's make a buck off of him. Let's sell him to some slave traders who will take him away and will never have to hear from him or see him again, which is exactly what they did. The slave traders took him down into Egypt. And in Egypt, he ends up working in the house as a slave of a very high-ranking official in Egypt, and just someone who was just under Pharaoh. 
And this is a pretty good thing because now, having been hated by his brothers and separated from his family and having had his whole life turned upside down and disrupted, finally there's a little bit of light at the end of this tunnel and he, he starts rising in responsibility and gaining more freedom in the house of Potiphar. Except Potiphar's wife takes a liking to him, but because of his integrity, Joseph keeps pushing her away and, and not yielding to her aggressions, which ends up having her turn on him and accuse him falsely. They put him in prison. So he's gone from slave to prison. And now in prison, he is finally starting to see a little bit of light in that dark place. Now he starts to rise up in the prison, believe it or not. Wherever he finds himself, God is with him. And so he starts to rise up in the ranks of the prison. He's starting to have more responsibility. More, he's still a prisoner. And keep in mind, this starts when he's 17. He enters Pharaoh's service when he's 30. We're talking about decades of suffering that this guy is going to experience when all of this is said and done. So it's not like an overnight deal. He's in prison. He meets one of the high officials of Pharaoh's court. He helps him out. And it looks like this guy might say a good word and, and, and things might turn around for him. He's promptly forgotten by this official. Until such a time as Pharaoh needed him. So what did we learn from last week about these disruptive moments? This is by, by way of review in case you missed it. It means that, that God, in the midst of these disruptions, is doing some remarkable things. He is working miracles and he is orchestrating all of this incredible stuff around us in order to accomplish his plans. We also learned that, that and this is you know, something challenging, God is doing his work in us and he's making us the kind of women, the kind of men that he wants us to be in the midst of the disruptions. I wish that was the only troubling thing that we learned. We also learned that God's timing in these things, of course, to us, any disruption feels like terrible timing because they're disruptions. And so they are a terrible timing. But of course, we get into the story and we realize, no, these things happen in exactly the way that God wants them to happen hard truth. But in it, we get to see God wrench beauty from the ashes. We also get to see that even though we know what really happened to Joseph and how he got to Egypt, right? We know his boneheaded brothers did it. That's how this whole thing took place. But that's not how Joseph tells the story. Joseph tells the story that when his life was disrupted, when it was turned upside down, it was God who sent him there? This is what he tells us in Genesis 45. And now, do not be distressed. He's speaking to his brothers. And do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. What? God sent him there. That was Joseph's take on the whole thing. He said it another way at the end of Genesis. He said, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. This is a, a wildly important tool for surviving and thriving in the midst of these disruptions. And so that's as much review as I can do. If that's of any interest to you, we posted it online. You can go check the, the whole message out from last week. So now in the midst of those disruptions, how is it that Joseph did not let bitterness or resentment poison his soul? And that's where we find our second practical tool for dwelling in the midst of these disruptions. It's something I like to call godly forgetfulness. Godly forgetfulness. So let's look at uh, Genesis 41, starting in verse 46. Joseph was 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh. So this is right when he finally gets out of prison. The service of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from Pharaoh's presence and traveled throughout Egypt. During the seven years of abundance, the land produced plentifully. Joseph collected all the food produced in those seven years in abundance in Egypt and stored it in the cities. In each city, he put the food grown in the fields surrounding it. Joseph stored up huge quantities of grain, like the sand of the sea. It was so much that he stopped keeping records because it was beyond measure. Before the years of famine came, two sons were born to Joseph by Esenoth, daughter of Potipharah, priest of On. 
Joseph named his firstborn Manasseh and said, it is because but God has made me forget all my trouble and all my father's household. So he names his son Manasseh. In the Hebrew, it means to forget. And I'm thinking about that this week, and I'm like, really? But, but the, I love that idea. It's a really nice sentiment. The thing is, it, it, can it, is it actually true? Like, so it doesn't make any sense because he's saying, listen, I forgot all about my suffering, so I'm naming my son Forget. But if you'd forgotten it, you wouldn't know to name your son Forget. So you clearly haven't forgotten it. Otherwise, it, so it's a nonsensical sentence. So you're looking at it, you're like, well, how does that actually work? Because have you, do you actually, think about it. Go ahead and go through the list. You've already got a few things that people have done to you over the years that you're really upset about. It's disrupted your life. It's broken your heart. Go ahead and pull, you know, pull them back to mind. Even if you have done deep soul work on these things, have you really forgotten it? I mean, is it really just gone? Like all of a sudden, you know, years from now, you're kind of walking down the street and like, oh, yeah, I forgot that horrible life transitioning thing ever occurred to me. Doesn't happen. I love the idea of it. It's just it isn't reality. I mean, do we ever really forget it? So we have to ask ourselves, what is it that Joseph means? What does he mean here when he says that God made me forget? And this is where this idea of godly forgetfulness sort of comes in. You can take it from a whole variety of different places, but there's a passage in Hebrews that I really like because this is speaking about God now. And it says, I will, for I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. Wait, so the Bible tells us that God forgets our sins. I'm like, wow, that's fantastic. But of course, can we actually think that God doesn't remember something? Like, would I have just reminded him about it if I talked about it again? Like, would he be like, oh, yeah, I forgot. You know, we have this idea like God's up there. He's like, oh, man, where where did I put the remote? Like, I can't find the remote. Like, God, that doesn't in a category. I don't really think God watches TV, by the way. You know, I just... I think he's got plenty of drama right here with all of us to watch. He's like, that's a reality show for him. So, but, so, so what does it mean? Well, it, what, what, what's going on here, when we talk about godly for, forgetfulness, we have to recognize that when life is disrupted because of the, the failures and the sin of other people, this is going to be a cross that you will have to bear. It's from them, but it's your cross to bear. And you know what this is like. <clears throat> if you have a drunk driver who takes someone that you love, this is your cross to bear forever. Or maybe they've given you the gift, that same driver, maybe they gave you the gift of chronic pain every day for the rest of your life yours to bear. If, you, if your doctor misses a diagnosis or screws up a surgery, these are difficult situations. You have a lover who has betrayed your trust and violates the sacred marriage vows that you've made. You won't go many days where you won't think about it. Maybe a stranger enters an apartment and shoots your brother in the chest. Every day, your cross to bear. And in those, in those times, it's easy for us to want them to drink the poison. We actually want to say, but, but these, were, this, these things were wrong. Someone has to pay. That would be right. That would be justice. And godly forgetfulness means that we agree with God not to hold the wrongs committed against us, against them. We're agreeing with God. We refuse to make them drink the poison. And in turn, we don't have to drink it ourselves. That's how God works this thing out for us. Now, I'm not saying, by the way, that there's no justice or no consequences or anything like that. That's a message, a whole other kind of a topic. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm talking about here is that godly forgetfulness brings us to the place 
of the forgiveness for the wrongs that are committed against us. And this forgiveness is at the very heart of everything we hold dear as followers of Christ. Forgiveness has been described as uh, letting go of all hope for a different past. And I really love that idea. We're saying, listen, this is what happened. This is the reality. This is the situation. These are the circumstances. And today, I am saying, I don't need those to be changed. They are. They happened. It's reality. I can actually move forward from this day by letting go of what has happened in the past. And that forgiveness, then, it allows us to take some measure of control back for our spiritual and our emotional well-being. How often I've spoken to people, and we're talking about what's happened in the past and how it controls their present and their future. And if you think about that, if we allow that to happen, we're giving great power back to the people that have already hurt us. Why would you want to give more power to the people who have hurt you so they can continue hurting you into the future. Not only is resentment a sin in our hearts, but we end up seeing it start to twist us up and, and steal from us for many, many years. And we can take it back and we can now put it in the hands, the only hands in the whole of the universe that can actually do something that matters with our hurt. Now, over the years, of course, and even last week, we kind of talked about this a little bit. There's parallels between the life of Joseph and the life of Jesus. And scholars love to point these things out. You know, Joseph and Jesus, both the favored child of their father. Both of them ended up, you know, being thrown into a pit in the ground only to be rescued from it. So, you know, that, that, that uh, you know, they wouldn't have to continue in that, that place of death. And, and those are great parallels, and they're really exciting. It's a fun study to do. But there's actually a, a, a very fascinating thread of theology that comes from Jewish rabbinic sources that points us in this same direction. Unintentionally from, uh, fr from the rabbis' perspectives, because of course they wouldn't have been readily pointing to Christ, but it's hard to miss the connections. There is this figure in rabbinic literature called Messiah ben Joseph. Messiah ben Joseph, which really just means Messiah, the son of Joseph, or, you know, Joseph's son, the Messiah, something like that. And in Jewish literature, outside of the scriptures, there developed this idea that there were at least two messiahs. In fact, there might even be as many as four, but there are at least two messiahs. And where it started, no one's really 100% sure uh, but it does seem as if it might be rooted in texts like the one that we're looking at. Because the life of Joseph so powerfully represents a different way of saving and rescuing God's people. Right? We're most familiar with Messiah ben David. That's the other Messiah that gets most of the, uh, the airtime. Messiah son of David is referring to King David who ushered in the golden era in Israel's history. And so that's the Messiah that we're all sort of hoping for. He's the one that's going to come and restore peace on earth. He's going to build up God's people. He's going to vanquish all the enemies. And he's going to just bring in this golden era of, uh, of uh, humanity's uh, supreme uh, tra uh, transcendency. We're going to, to see things that we've never imagined. It's utopia put into the hands of Messiah ben David. But there is another picture that emerges, this other Messiah, Messiah ben Joseph. And if you want to kind of look at it later on on your own, you look at, look at the prophet Zechariah, Daniel chapter 9, Deuteronomy 33, Isaiah 53, and all the suffering servant kind of things. But in these passages, we start to see a picture of another character. And there's a Jewish tradition that explains that these the kind of these two contrasting views of Messiah. And it says that if the people of Israel will be righteous, the Messiah will come in the clouds of heaven. That sounds like Messiah ben David. He's going to come in the clouds of heaven and he's going to end all heartache and misery. But it goes on to point to a different path. It says, if they will not be righteous, so if God's people will not be righteous, 
he will come as a poor man riding upon a donkey, which of course is exactly what Jesus did. He came as a poor man riding on a donkey. Why? Because this is the picture of a different kind of Messiah. This one is going to look more like Joseph, which means he's going to look more like a prisoner. He's going to look more like a slave. He's going to experience heartache. In fact, it says that because the people are unrighteous, which means they need a redeemer, that this Messiah is going to accomplish the purging of Israel's sin in a great battle that he wages against the enemies of God. But in our case, the same went, held true for Jesus. He waged war against the enemies of the people of God. In this case, it was Satan and sin in our hearts. And he waged war. And it says that Messiah ben Joseph, the traditions tell us, that he will not actually rule and reign that he's only preparing the kingdom for Messiah ben David. And what that means for Messiah ben Joseph is that he's actually not going to survive his battle. He's actually going to die outside the walls of Jerusalem, which, of course, is exactly where Jesus died. Outside the walls of Jerusalem, battling the enemies of God. Now, the rabbis, of course, saw two messiahs, but in hindsight, we get to see only one. When Jesus first came, he was Messiah ben Joseph at the cross. And we're promised that he is going to return again in the clouds, and in that day, he will be Messiah ben David. But for us to know that we have a messiah who would save his people through his intense personal suffering, We get to now stop and say, how did they do it? How could Messiah ben Joseph accomplish it? How could Jesus accomplish it? He did it through godly forgetfulness. Because he will not hold our sins against us. So how do we do it? Well, we have to start by asking, who do we need to forgive in our lives? And you might say, well, I need to forgive this guy and that guy and this guy and that guy. And some of you are like, actually, the person that's most responsible for the disruptions in my life is me. And that's where I put most of my blame and most of my heart heartache on my own shoulders. Well, then great. These will apply to you as well. So how do you route this resentment? You start with confession. You confess that resentment has taken up residence in your heart. You admit that you cannot chase it out on your own. You pray, God, listen, I need your help to get this out of me. I want to let it go. It starts with confession. And we got to repent of all the false thinking that allows it to stay in our hearts. We get to say, God is good and God is powerful and I can trust in him. You might say, yes, but they don't deserve forgiveness. Yes, that is true. They don't. None of us do. It is always an act of grace. You get to confess all of this wrong thinking. And that gives you the ability now to forgive. You commit yourself to loving your enemy, forgiving those who hurt you, and promising not to do them any harm. This goes right at the root of resentment in our hearts. Promise not to do them any harm. And then you've got to practice it. You've got to practice this kind of forgetfulness. And that means you take every one of these thoughts. Whenever you see re resentment spring up, you've got to grab it and you need to pull it apart for what it is. You need to see what it is. You've got to look at the bitterness. You've got to look at the frustration. You have to look at the anger and you've got to say, what is going on in my heart? And repeat the cycle. Bring it right back for confession and forgiveness. And you know how often you do it? Every single time you see it in your heart. You're asking the Spirit to reveal it to you. And you say, listen, Lord, that's what I want. I just, this is who I actually want to be. And I don't want any of these things. So you grab it, you practice it, and you do it fully and completely. And that'll allow you now to trust. And I picked this up from John Piper. He was talking about how if you could just hang your heart on a verse, if you could just memorize some, some passages about this, and every time use it as a spiritual discipline that these things come, you get to, to, to wash your soul 
of these resentful thoughts and desires and urges by using the Word of God and trusting the Word of God. And, and he offers us a verse that we might want to consider to use. It's Romans chapter 12. He says, do not take revenge. My dear friends, leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. He goes on to say, listen, what that verse promises us is that justice will ultimately be done. If you're holding on to your resentment because you feel like it, that, that justice has to be done, they're going to get away with it and that's wrong. He says, listen, put it in God's hands. God's saying nobody will get away with anything. Every single sin that has ever been committed against you or against anyone else in all the universe for all of time will be avenged. And we leave it in God's hand to decide how he will do it because there are only two ways that God is going to deal with every single sin that has ever been committed. The first is he will allow that sinner to experience eternal separation from him in hell. You will never be able to improve upon that. Why would you possibly even want to heap more punishment and suffering on a person who will be separated from God for all of eternity in hell. And the next way that he handles it is through the cross, where he offers them the very same forgiveness that he's given to you. And how in the world would we not want another person to experience the love and the forgiveness of God that allows them now to be in God's presence? How could we withhold that from them if God is willing to give it to them in the same way that he has given it to us? So we get to trust that God will exercise his vengeance. And you say, yes, but if they get forgiven, then it's never paid for. But of course, it was paid for by Messiah ben Joseph. By Christ on the cross, he took those sins upon himself as well. And if you really do this, then you'll find yourself increasingly at rest. Because you can say, I am ridding my heart of this poison. I'm allowing God to do the part that God must do. And I am trusting, practicing, and trusting that what God says about me and about him and about his love and the fact that he is doing something amazing in the midst of my disruptions, I'm trusting that that is in fact true and I'll rest in that. I'm going to ask the band to come up and they're going to lead us in a time of communion and a little bit of confession. As they do, I'm just going to offer up a word of prayer for us. Lord, what we need is for your spirit to reveal to us the many ways that we continue to let resentment grab hold of our hearts, that we allow our hurts and what others have done to us to shape our heart's attitude toward them and toward even toward others. And Lord, we don't want to be those kinds of people. What we want, Father, is for your spirit to transform us from the inside. Let us rest in the sacrifice of Christ. Let us turn to him. Lord, if there are people here who are struggling with resentment and they've never trusted in you as their savior, I pray that they would do that today, that they would surrender their lives fully and completely to you. And they would make the Messiah their Messiah, their savior. Save them not only from eternal judgment, punishment that is rightly ours, but from the power of sin each and every day from the tyranny of resentment. I pray, Lord, they would be saved from these things. In Christ's name.